Hi, I'm Sky Christofferson. I just I wanted to share this with you because on my flight over here yesterday, I uh, came across this page in this book called The Creative Destruction of Medicine. And this is hot off the press, 2012. Uh, wireless health and fitness monitoring, monitoring has helped create the quantified self movement. Started by two wired magazine editors, uh, its purpose is to use data about ourselves to improve our lives. A 2011 feature article by Forbes, journalist uh, Kashmir Hill, entitled Adventures in Self-Surveillance, AKA Extreme Naval Gazing, <laughs> provided a first person blow by blow account of trying most of the health and fitness uh, wireless gadgets that are currently available. So I just wanted to give you my account of uh, lifelong of extreme navel gazing and to talk about you know, some of the, the merits of that and um, the, the empowering nature of it uh, with respect to performance. Uh, I've had the privilege of leading two radically different lifestyles, one as an elite athlete uh, on the U.S. cycling team, and that was about eight years. Another in the startup <coughs> culture, uh, immersed kind of in you know the business environment in Seattle, Washington, uh, and then a year experiment to try to overcome some of you know these issues of declining health from the startup, and um, some really surprising results that came out of that experiment. Uh, my sport was velodrome cycling. Uh, it's the fastest flatland Olympic sport. Uh, speeds of over 45 miles an hour, uh, Siberian pine indoor facility, uh, 45 degree banking on the corners. It's kind of the ultimate controlled environment. When I was 19 years old, I won the uh, national championships in the 1,000 meter. It was an upset not only because I beat the reigning Olympic medalist, but also because I landed a spot in uh, what was called Project 96, and this was uh, leading up to the Atlanta Games, they put a lot of money into overhauling um, training methods and also e everything down to equipment. This is the Superbike 2 you see right here. It's the, one of the most aerodynamic bikes in history. So much so they actually banned it shortly after the Games. Uh, Project 96 took each component of performance, uh, isolated it, quantified it and then optimized it with personalized plans for each athlete. So an example would be, you know, lactate tolerance, they put us in the lab, finger prick, measured, you know, lactate levels, tried to get those as high as possible. The program produced more medals than we'd won since 84, and that was the boycott. So performance-wise, it was, it was very good. We weren't quite there with measuring sleep and diet. All of the other factors we were pretty good at quantifying. And I was fourth in the world in 98 and won the Olympic trials later in 2000 as well. Um, retired shortly after, married my wife Tamara, who's here tonight, fellow athlete as well. Uh, after we retired from sport, we went to UCSD in La Jolla and moved to Seattle um, to start an internet company. I was a, a platform for high dynamic range imaging. <coughs> And you know you hear that stat that nine out of ten startups fail. And for us as athletes, I mean that was the ultimate challenge. It's like we want to be in that ten percent. We'll do whatever it takes. So, you know, using the model from Project Ninety Six, breaking down each component of what was understood to lead to performance in a business sense. You know, again, isolating it, optimizing it. Uh, the results: we did one point two million in revenue the first year. Uh, we had huge growth. That required a lot of work hours, as <coughs> most of you know, I mean, 80 to 100 hour weeks, uh, frequent all-nighters, erratic sleeping, erratic diet. Uh, tons of physical symptoms came out of that in the first year. You know, everything from difficulty sleeping uh, led all the way up to, you know, headaches, migraines, uh, kind of crescendoed a year later with some chest pain in my pec and back between my shoulder blades. and. Uh, went to the ER um, to get that checked out. They were concerned about the cramping in the shoulder. So had a, oh my gosh, sorry. So had a, a CT scan with contrast and you know did, did the blood work. It was scary. I mean, I, the, in the ambulance they said, we don't want to freak you out or anything, but you might be having a heart attack right now. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, how did it come to this? I mean, I was riding on the track at 45 miles an hour shortly before and now I'm here. I just wanted my old life back. And I didn't want to feel tired. 
and all of the symptoms that were coming with that. So serendipitously, I, at a TED conference in San Diego, I saw Dr. Eric Topol giving a talk about the wireless uh, future of medicine. And so I, did, I decided to do a one-year experiment after talking to him about these new tools in measuring sleep and diet, uh, exercise were going to be kind of the core components. And in this experiment, they were non-negotiables. So uh, we measured sleep every night with the, the Zio, you wear a headband, and you get you know, tangible information about your sleep cycles, when you go to bed, when you wake up. And just being aware of that really changed the way I approached sleep and finally started getting some stability there. Uh, I also identified a trend in decreasing deep sleep uh, month to month, and we weren't sure why. We thought it could have been, I was also uh, riding again, I was doing some cycling training, and I thought that increasing load could have been affecting that, but ultimately, we realized the room was getting hotter and hotter every month. We don't have AC, and so as we got closer to the summer, uh, we tested that with this um, cooling mattress pad where you can actually set the temperature, which is effective because it's right under your body and it's not dependent on the air temperature or how you pull the covers over you. So you can see the results. When I added that, wow. set it uh, ultimately at 66 degrees, my deep sleep increased radically. You see that orange line? That's the national average for a 30-year-old. So probably not enough <laughs> deep sleep. Uh, and this is the overall tracking uh, through this year experiment. That was exercise, cycling, diet, <coughs> sleep, and then some mood tracking. Some mentioned this before on the bottom there, um, with things like everything from sex drive to you know, overall feeling of well-being. So what were the results of this experiment? After a year, I uh, had almost complete reversal of symptoms. You know, a lot of this this deep um, joint pain that I had in my, my hips and my knees, back, uh, uh, bleeding in the gums, uh, anal fissure that was letting bacteria in my bloodstream. I had kind of this ongoing inflammation. Literally, it was like someone hit the rewind button and all of that started reversing. Athletically, I was really surprised because I started beating the performances I had in my 20s and now I'm 35 years old and it's thought that with declining testosterone and some of these other issues from aging, um, performance wouldn't be possible. And ultimately, that led to a world record last summer. Um, and <laughs> which was really surprising. Uh, the previous holder of that um, got a lifetime ban for drug use. So that's <laughs> yeah, pointing to you know, some, some exciting results of this, this kind of program. So the model here is just this health, I call it health performance, and I think if you can focus on these pillars of health and well-being, that will drive performance in other areas. We're actually applying the concepts with the sleep and with the diet to the current women's Olympic team getting ready for London this summer. And one of the things is the continuous blood glucose monitoring, which I have here. These are my results. I just got this sensor a week ago, and for the first time I can see continuous, real-time data about what's happening in my blood. And you mentioned this in your presentation. All right, right off the bat, I identified two areas of hypoglycemia. I uh, went and corrected those, noticed instant improvements in sleep and just you know, kind of energy throughout the day. Uh, this is something I'm working on for a TED Talk uh, two months from now looking at ways to integrate this into you know, more of a corp corporate planning or, or project planning. Um, and that's it. So uh, thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, Dan, super interesting. So d did, I, did I miss something? Or are you basically saying the intervention that you did which led to your restoration of health was the tracking. Uh, yeah, the, tr the tracking was very motivating for me. As an, as an athlete, if I can see a number attached to something and kind of break a record or, or, or you know, sur surpass you know, personal bests or whatever, that's something I could get behind. And as soon as Dr. Topol was talking about quantifying sleep for the first time, I thought, I can make a game out of it, I can get behind this. It didn't seem like this abstract thing that maybe I could hide from other people or I could just kind of ignore myself, you know, pulling all-nighters with the startup. 
Um, so that was really helpful in that so, sense. So you feel like that was like you, it was more about the quantification than it was about behavior change. I knew I, you know, there there was that inflection point. I mean, I was terrified in the ambulance and knew I had to change something. Um, <coughs> there, were, there were suggestions from the doctor about how to treat the symptoms, and doing the math on that. I mean, it was adding up. It was going to be extremely expensive to you know start treating the blood pressure get the dental cleanings, treating some of these other issues um, one by one. And I was looking for some way to just kind of turn the whole ship in a different direction. And so I think of finally being able to quantify the kind of these core pillars of health is what really got me excited about that. Question back here. Uh, yeah, quick question. How did the startup fare while you were focusing on your health and mm -hmm. shifting mm -hmm. behaviors? <laughs> right. Well, you asked my wife about that. We, we worked together on that. And fortunately, in a, when you have a good team like that, you know, you can shift workload around. And, you know, I'll admit there was the beginning of this program was it took a lot of energy. And, you know, getting, getting my fitness back and the training, there were, there were times where I was exhausted, you know, um, starting to get momentum again. But I'd say after three, four, or five months, and I started making those adaptations again, and started imp improving my baseline health overall, um, the energy really started coming back. And I would argue that actually the, the work my work performance was better at once I made those adaptations and that health improved than it was during the startup. And you know, sometimes <coughs> you think, well, if, I, if we went back and didn't pull those all-nighters to make those deadlines, would, it, would this approach have, have been as effective? And I've thought about that a lot because it's a tough question. You know, if you're going, if you have a deadline coming up, that means, hey, it's nine o'clock, the computer goes off, and you're going to sleep. I mean, that's a, that's a tough thing to really stick with. But I think that the level of cognitive performance, and, and we covered this as well, um, when you're a couple notches up in awareness, you'll solve problems that would take you hundreds of hours working you know, down the wrong direction when you're in that kind of tired, you know, just worn out state of mind and where you just, you don't even care really what, you know, you're just kind of trudging along. So I, I think that performance actually would have been better with the health in place and much more sustainable. Okay. So you were describing this uh, 96, year 96 project where everything was being quantified. Besides sleep, was there anything that you were quantifying now that you weren't then? Because it seems like you were just sort of recapturing what you were doing back in 96, except right. for the sleep. Is, right. that, is that true? Yeah, they, uh, and actually there's another uh, Project 96 member here tonight, Adam Laurent, who I just wanted to say was part of those excellent results we had. He was fourth in the individual pursuit at the 1996 Olympics. And you know, you, we, you can ask Adam about this afterwards as well, but I think that there was a bit of awareness there around sleep and, and diet, but the, it, it just, it wasn't looked at, you know, as some, in, a, in a tangible kind of way. It was like, well, you know, sleep support, so go to bed eventually, you know, and, and, and don't show up at the workout sleeping for four hours. But, it, but we didn't know, you know, temperature and, and how important a lot of those things were. Diet as well. Steve? Um, the data that you gathered in terms of quantifying yourself, what kinds of dietary or lifestyle changes did it validate for you? Uh, the, the dietary changes that I made were um, elimination of sugar. That was a big thing. And I think that had a lot to do with um, you know, the inflammation immune system. I, I mean, I definitely felt better overall and had uh, much steadier energy as a result of that. And then this, getting this new data with continuous glucose monitoring, you can really see how certain dietary choices have immediate impacts on that. And you'll notice too, when you get tired during the day, a lot of that is just dips in glucose. And you'll see, oh, I'm tired. And you look at the thing, sure enough, whoop, you know, time to eat and you can make those adjustments, so. Um, so how did you, it seemed like you have metrics coming in from all over the place. Yeah. Uh, how did you go about sort of the mental calculus of saying, I'm going to, well, your first intervention, I guess, was quantifying everything, right? But then that leads to success, successive interventions, right? So how did you decide 
what your next intervention was going to be, right? I mean, the, the example you showed about the sleep is fine, but how do you right. know it wasn't something you ate that was keeping you up or you were worrying about or, or whatever? Right, yeah, that's a great question. The, the lack of control, you know, I mean, having, scientifically, it's tough with self-experimentation because you have so many variables. And I would have to kind of live 10 times over at the same age and the same environment to really be able to isolate and know what was leading to what. But I think the, the, the exciting thing here is that as we start tracking these things and developing correlations, we're going to start seeing how all of these are interrelated. And a lot of things I know in my gut, and I'll, you know, you, you'll be able to feel a difference. But in finally getting those kind of mathematically related is, is going to be really exciting. In, in the near future here. So I know there's a lot more questions, but we'll be hanging out afterwards, but let's give a big thanks.